On Friday morning, I had coffee with a new friend of mine named Shane Cavanaugh. Shane is a journalist with The Oregonian, and Shane and I got to know each other last year through a few stories that he told about our church. Shane and I check in with each other over social media periodically, but we decided that it was time to meet in person over a cup of coffee. Shane asked me what was on my mind these days, and there are a few things that uh, spilled out of my mouth, things that seem to put us all at risk. One of those things is the coronavirus. So I told Shane about my worries and the different levels of anxiety that are within me and the different levels of anxiety that I sense here at our congregation. And I told him that we've made a few changes in our worship service in response to the virus and that I don't want to downplay or overplay the risks of this. How do we appropriately prepare for this without adding to the anxiety and fears that we all already have. And as I continued to express my fears and anxieties about how to deal with fear and anxiety, Shane listened patiently. And when I finished, he looked at me with compassion in his eyes as he said, well, Adam, I'm not very religious, but it sounds like it might be a good time to remind people to love their neighbors. <laughs> I thought, oh, right, that's the point. Shane continued to say that our culture generally trains us to think primarily about ourselves. We are trained to wonder about the potential health risks and wonder, how is this going to affect me? Fear tends to make us focus on ourselves. He said that we need to move from a me only mentality so that we become concerned about others. Part of the problem, Shane said, is that while people do need to stay home when they feel sick, staying at home leads to a feeling of great isolation for people, especially for those among us who are older. So we need to routinely check in on our neighbors and friends to see how they are doing so that none of us feel alone in this. To which I wanted to say to Shane, how about you come preach the sermon this Sunday? <laughs> yeah. As our conversation continued, we discussed my other major anxiety, the current political climate. The risks seem so high, don't they? I lamented the fact that just six months ago, it felt like everyone was pretty much on the same page, and now it feels so angry and fragmented and hostile. And personally, I'm feeling exhausted by it all. Shane lamented too. He replied that it all feels very tribal, and that this tribal mentality goes back thousands of years, if not hundreds of thousands of years. It's an us against them mentality and was beneficial in our evolutionary process as it united a group when it came to the risks of outside invaders. But now it seems to put us at greater threats than ever because the dangers feel out of control, affecting at greater levels every aspect of our culture, including our politics, our religion, and our health. And as Shane talked, my mind was making connections to the studying I did last week about our readings for today. I think it's true that tribalism has always plagued humanity. The bond within a family or tribe is of course a good thing, but becomes very dangerous when we define our tribe over and against others. This leads to division and hostility against people based on race, ethnicity, religion, political party, gender, sexuality, the list goes on and on. And we see this tribal division in the Bible too. It's easy to find where the Bible divides the world into us against them. I've come to believe that the Bible was written by people who were trying to understand how God is working in their lives. Sometimes they got it wrong 
like when they fall into the trap of believing that God was tribal, that God loved them and hated their enemies. But sometimes the authors of the Bible got it right. Like in our passage from Genesis this morning, the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic stories really start with a man named Abraham and a woman named Sarah. Abraham and Sarah began their lives together just like everybody else back then, living in their own tribe where they thought that the gods were for them and against other tribes. But when Abraham and Sarah continued, encountered something new in human history, Abraham and Sarah encountered a God who came to them and said, Go from your country and your kindred, and I will bless you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And I, I, inv I invite you to see something different happening here. The God of Abraham and Sarah is different. This is a notch forward in human social evolution. This God is not tribal. This God is universal. Abraham and Sarah were blessed by God, but they were not to keep the blessing to themselves. They had a purpose that was beyond themselves. They were to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. All the families. The poor families. The rich families. The heterosexual families the lesbian and gay and bisexual and transgender and queer families, the undocumented families, ill families, Muslim families, atheist families, Republican families, Democratic families, black families, brown families, white families, all the families of the earth. There were no exceptions. Jesus knew that this was true. He knew that God wasn't tribal, which is why he said those famous words in our passage today. For God so loved the world. The word for world in Greek here is cosmos. For God so loved the cosmos. All of it. God, God's love isn't just for you, and it's not just for me. It's not just for those who look and act like us. It's for people who are radically different from us, too. In fact, God loves the entire cosmos. Jesus was formed by this vision of God that goes all the way back to Abraham and Sarah. And this is what Jesus meant when he said you have to be born again because we are born into a culture that teaches us to divide the world into us against them. And so when Jesus says you need to be born, above, born again or born from above, these are the heavenly things that Jesus is talking about. It's a new way of life that we have to be born into that leads us to live into this God who doesn't divide the world into us and them, but works for justice in the spirit of love. But I want you to notice something else about this story of faith. It is risky. But it's a different kind of risk than what we have with the coronavirus or current political turmoil. It's an intentional risk that seeks to move beyond our comfort zones, beyond ourselves, beyond our tribe, so that we might love our neighbors, especially those who are most in need. Abraham and Sarah would have had a nice life living in their tribe. They could have stayed in their comfort zones as they primarily worried about themselves and their own tribe. But Abraham and Sarah heard God's call, and Jesus heard that call too. It's not a call to comfort. It's a call to risk as we move beyond ourselves to add more love and justice into the world. For example, Jesus didn't stay in his hometown of Nazareth. Instead, he left that comfort zone as he traveled all around Israel and Samaria, healing the sick, feeding the hungry, blessing the poor, and preaching God, the good news that God is love. 
And this takes some amount of faith for us, doesn't it? To leave our comfort zones on this journey, and as my friend Shane said to me on Friday, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. During this time of political turmoil and during this time of the health crisis, what can we do? All of the advice is wash your hands, disinfect areas you frequently use, stay home when you are sick, and that is all good advice. But the age-old wisdom keeps coming back to me. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's true that people are going to start feeling isolated, more isolated than we already do in our fractured culture. If you notice that someone hasn't been to church or you haven't seen a neighbor in a while, give them a phone call, write them a letter. The challenge for our current time is to move beyond ourselves, to take some risks so that we may take the journey beyond our comfort zone to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. May we take this risk together. May we journey on this path together so that all the families of the earth may be blessed. And as we risk the journey together, may the God who loves the entire world be embodied in us. Amen. Hi everyone, this is Adam Erickson, reminding you that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome at Clackamas United Church of Christ. We are located at 15303 Southeast Webster Road in Milwaukee, Oregon. We are so glad that you found this podcast. All of our podcasts will always be free, but we rely on the financial support of our members and our friends. If this podcast meant something to you, you can help us out in two ways. You can share this podcast with someone you think might be interested. You can also help us financially by donating to the wonderful missions we have here at Clackamas United Church of Christ. To do so, you can go to our Facebook page, our website, or our YouTube channel and click on the Donate Here button. Our worship services start at 1030 on Sundays, except for during the summer months when we start at 10 o'clock. If you would like more information on our church, you can visit our website at c-ucc.org. You can also reach out to me through email at adam at c-ucc.org. Until next time, grace and peace be with you.